Well, happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Man, it's a day when we celebrate the, the love that we have for each other. I don't know about you guys, but I've been thinking about whenever I was a kid in elementary school. Did any of y'all ever go to elementary school on Valentine's Day and like you would have a whole sack full of Valentines, or as I used to call them, Valentines back in the day. Have this whole sack of Valentines and you'd give one to everybody in the class and pretty much everybody in the class gave one to you. Now you would you kind of be you know, a little bit uh, you know, slick about how you did that. You might save your best Valentine, you know, to Put, give that one to your crush on the low a little bit, you know. But everybody in your class got a Valentine from you, some expression of love, and probably you received from everybody in the class, at least we used to, a little Valentine that just said, hey, man, I'm thinking about you. Everybody. Now, let's be real. With so much division and so much animosity and hatred that's permeating our world right now. And I'm not just talking about around the world and the nation. I'm talking about where you work, where we live, maybe even in your house or apartment with your roommates and friends. Man, we could really stand a Valentine's Day. Now, I'm not suggesting that you're going to go to work tomorrow, show up at the office with a bag full of Valentines, uh, although we might need to do that. It might come to that. But here's the idea. The idea is that we should be giving love to people. Matter of fact, the scripture commands us to pass out love every day, everywhere, to everybody. Jesus said this in John chapter 13, verse 34. He said, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. He calls it a new command. Remember the old command was, we'll look at it in a minute. The old command was love your neighbor as you love yourself. But the problem with that is there are so many people in our world today, quite honestly, they just don't love themselves. And hurting people tend to hurt other people. And so we don't naturally possess sometimes this love within us to love like Jesus is calling us to love. So Jesus offers us a new command, a new source, and a new standard of what love should be. Love others, he said, as I have loved you. Jesus is the source of love, and I want to speak it over you. He is crazy about you on this Valentine's Day. You may not love yourself, but Jesus loves you. He knows everything about you. He knows what you did, good and bad and worse. All the stuff you want to hide, cover, lie about, and are ashamed by. And he loves you still. He loves you so much that he gave up heaven to come to earth, to die on a cross, to pay for your sins. Listen, so that he would never have to be without you in relationship. He wants that relationship with you so badly. And this love is transformational. His love changes how you feel about yourself. It changes the conversation in your head when you really realize that Jesus loves you. And you have to remind yourself of that, but it changes your conversation in your head. He's the source of love, and he's the new standard for it. Now watch this. Jesus doesn't just want you to sit there today and go, you know what, Jesus, I receive your love. I'm so thankful for that. Jesus now wants you. The love that you get is the love that you now give. To the people maybe sitting beside you, watching with you right now, worshiping together. To the people that you dread seeing tomorrow at school or work or wherever. God wants you to take the love that you've been given, recycle it, and now give it away. He doesn't command you to give love you haven't received. He commands you to give the love that you have. Love like he has loved you. The love you get is the love that you give. Now, here are just a couple thoughts about this idea of loving. Look, I thank God that he loves you first. You didn't love him first. You're not out there searching for God, and maybe God will show up one day. No, God's searching for you. God loves you. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. And God loves you even though you don't deserve it. I've said that a minute ago, but, but the Bible clearly says that in Romans 5, 8. It says, but God demonstrates his love toward you, even though while you were yet a sinner, that means still a sinner, Christ died for you. You don't deserve it, and yet God loves you anyway. You were and may still be a hot mess, but man, Jesus loves you right where you are. Now, love is so simple. It sounds so easy. I mean, it's, the, it's, it's what God's calling us to do. It sounds so simple, and yet we get things mixed up. We can lose sight of our primary, this primary thing that Jesus has called us to do, even in the church. It's easy, even in the church, to get focused on yourself 
And what am I going to get out of it? Or what I gave at church today? Or what you deserve? And you lose sight of what Jesus taught. Now, we're going to be in the book of Corinthians today, 1 Corinthians 13. You can go ahead and turn there in your Bible or pull out your app and open up to 1 Corinthians 13. Paul's writing to the church of Corinth, and they've lost sight of love. They're talking about a good thing. They're talking about spiritual gifts, which ones are are really impressive and which ones aren't as impressive. And that devolved into this conversation about who's most important. And talking about a good thing led them to miss the best thing, and that is love. What really mattered, Paul writes, is love. He wrote to remind them of the most excellent way, a better way to live, and that is the way of love. Now, 1 Corinthians 13, you may know, is the love chapter. So here we are on Valentine's Day. We're going to read the love chapter. And I don't want you to get lost in all the different things that Paul says about love and that we're going to talk about. Here's what I want you to hear. That as you sit here right now in the presence of God with the word open, that God wants you to learn to be a better lover. He wants you to be one who gives love to everybody that you meet. Okay? Now, again, we're going to let the word inform us as to what that looks like, but let's let our hearts today be set on that fact. God, teach me how to love people better. Okay? We're going to learn a couple of truths that will help us. The first one is this. Love matters most. So if you're a note taker, you can write that down. Love matters most. I get this right out of verses 1 through 3 where Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but I do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. You sound like somebody that does not know how to play and yet they're trying to play anyway. If I have the gift of prophecy and I know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but if I don't have love, man, I'm nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but I don't have love, it profits me nothing. Paul's writing to these people and he's saying, listen, spiritual gifts are important, but they're not nearly as important as love. They're worried about what gift they have. And Paul says, listen, don't worry about the gift that God's given you in your spirit. Worry about the love of God that the spirit has given you in your heart. Pastor Rick Warren kind of summarizes these verses this way. God is saying that you can have the eloquence of an orator. You can have the knowledge of a genius. You can have the faith of a miracle worker. You can have the generosity of a philanthropist. And you can have the dedication of a martyr. But if you don't have love, it doesn't count. That's the way I'd say it. You can be a powerful charismatic. You can be doctrinally sound and on point. You can have a huge heart as a social activist. But if you don't have love, you're just making noise. You're wasting time. Think about that. Think about that, Christian people, those of us who call us followers, call ourselves followers of Christ. If you don't have love, it doesn't matter how smart, how gifted, how whatever else you are, if you don't have love, it's a waste of time. Now, what kind of love are we talking about? And I think we need to clarify because there's so many different definitions of what love can really mean. I mean, in our English language, we're a little bit limited because we have one word, love, that's supposed to cover a lot of different things, right? We can like, for instance, you can say, oh, I love that dress. Oh, I love my dog. Oh, I love ice cream. Oh, I love going to the beach. I love a good movie. I love my spouse. But do you love your spouse as much as you love your dog or in the same way? Don't answer that, some of you right? I'm convinced if my wife had to choose between me and our dog, Gracie, she would pick me, but she'd probably have to pray about it. Come on, anybody know what I'm saying? She'd probably have to pray about that a little bit. But, but we have one word that says, man, I love everything. Now, in the Greek language, they weren't limited like that. They actually had four different words to describe different types of varieties of love. So you knew what you were dealing with. One of those words you've probably heard is the word phileo. It's, a, it's kind of a brotherly. It's a family. It's a, it's a true love. It's an affection, a deep affection for people. And that's a great thing to have. You maybe have heard of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. That's a good thing. God sometimes calls people to love that way. There's also another word, eros. You've probably heard of that one as well. It talks about erotic or sexual love filled with passion and fireworks and emotion. A lot of people, young people especially, uh, feel this and don't even have a bottle of wine to help them, right? They just, they feel this. Then there's storge. That's a settled love. It's a contented, kind of a a passionless love. If you're over 55, you know what I'm feeling right now, right? You, you, You probably understand storge love, right? And then there's agape love. 
Agape love is a self-sacrificing love. It's, it's a uniquely Christian and word that's defined by Jesus. It's used in the Bible to describe the way that God the Father and God the Son love each other. It's, it's used to describe the way God loves you, and it's the same word used to describe how God calls us to love each other. Please don't miss it. God's not calling you to have more Philadelphia love. He's not calling you to have more Eros love. He's not calling you to to settle into a a boring, maybe, you know, settled storge love. He is calling you. He's calling me to increase in this self-sacrificing, others elevating love. Love is the one thing you must do, Paul says. It matters most, and here's why. Because God is love, 1 John 4, 8. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Love's not God, but God is love. So when you love with Christ's love, you're demonstrating the character of God. And I think this is God, was God's plan from the beginning in the Garden of Eden, that we would be image bearers and that we would reflect him wherever we go, and we were supposed to reflect the love of God. And we did until sin entered in. He is love, and as Christians, the first fruit of the Spirit, the first result of you having God living inside of you, the fruit of the Spirit is love. It's the first indicator that you really belong to God. And Jesus said the whole world is going to know that we belong to him, not because we preach the doctrine, not because we're out there in the streets demanding social engagement. The world will know that we belong to him when we have love, when we love other people. Now, now, I need to read this verse. I need to show it to you because we need to hear it. 1 John 4, 20 says, If someone says, I love God, and yet hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who doesn't love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Now, come on, think about that in the context of divorces, rival schools, Democrats and Republicans. Think about that. If you say, oh, I love God, but man, I hate them. Something is wrong. Can you acknowledge that? Can we we at least agree on that? That that if that's our mindset, something is amiss because 1 John 4, 20 says you can't harbor and hold on to love in your heart indefinitely as a way of life and say you still love God because God is love. And love is God's greatest commandment. Jesus was asked the most important commandment. You know it like I know it. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. It's the greatest and foremost commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two depend the law and the, the whole law and the prophets. You can summarize the whole Old Testament by love God and love your neighbor. Look, Whenever you're doing your Bible reading this year, when you get to Leviticus, you ain't even got to read it. Just say, well, it says love God and love your neighbor. That's kind of it. And I'm lying. You need to read it. But essentially, that's what it's trying to say. Love God. And out of that overflow of love from God and for God, love other people. Hate is too heavy for you to carry. That's what Dr. King said. That's what the word says. Bitterness will bury you. Paul says there's a more excellent way And that is the way of love. And so even right now, right now in this moment, riding down the road, sitting on the back porch, wherever you are, would you just exhale and say, God, I give you all the negative feelings that I've had. God, all the stuff that's been pent up and built up inside of me. God, I just need to exhale that. And I'm inviting you to fill me with love. It's the most important thing. And love, I'm convinced, communicates to other people how God feels about them. That when you love, you are actually being the hands, feet, eyes, voice, and heart of God the Father. Love shows that that person matters. Whether they deserve it or not, I didn't deserve it. You don't deserve God's love, and yet he gives it. So it's not about whether somebody deserves it. Maybe that's the very reason you need to give and demonstrate love. It's so that they know they matter, even though they might not deserve it. They're they're worthy of love because they're God's creation. God's not wanting, listen, God's not wanting something from the world. God is wanting something for the world. He wants them to know that he loves them like crazy. And when you act in love, you're sharing the heart of God. So more important than serving in the church, leading at your home, or having your voice heard in the community is love. So here's my question. 
How do you think God wants you to treat the people in your, your house today on Valentine's Day? What do you think? To give the chocolate candies ain't enough. What do you think? Is that what he really wants? Does he want you to cook a meal? How does God want you to do How does God want you to treat people at school tomorrow? How does he want you to treat people whenever you go to work? God's calling you to love. Love people in traffic. Love people who don't see the world the same way you see it. Love. Jeff Redding's a part of our church staff. He knew I was talking on love today. He sent me a text message, and he just said this. Most young men today begin a search in marriage asking, how can I lead my wife well? I want to be the spiritual leader. But Jeff said the first direction isn't to lead. It's to love. You'll never become the leader until you first become a lover. Love is God's desire. Spot on. Love matters most. Start there, stay there. All right? So if you're going to become a better lover, love matters most. Here's the second thing we're going to learn from Paul today is that love is primarily a choice, not an emotion. Love's primarily a choice, not an emotion. I did not say that love has no emotion, for it does. Even agape, I believe, has emotion. But the emotions of love, can we agree, the emotions of love kind of ebb and flow. They kind of rise and fall, kind of like the tide. But God's love, the kind of love he's calling us to is deeper. It goes beyond just emotion. Look at verse 4. This is the part you remember about this scripture. You heard it at a wedding. Maybe it was read at your wedding. Maybe you need to remember. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love does not brag. It is not arrogant. Love doesn't act unbecomingly. It doesn't seek its own. It's not provoked. Love doesn't take into account a wrong suffered. Love doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness, but it rejoices with the truth. Now, if you go back and look at all those descriptors, there are t- at least 10 of them. Every one of those descriptors look like nouns. Love is this, but they're not. In every case, a little, little Greek lesson for you right now. In every case, every one of those descriptors are active verbs. Every one of them. Every one of them are verbs. They're not nouns. They're not passive. They're things that you actually do. Some some of you think, man, I fell out of love, or I fell into love, or I've lost that loving feeling. Love that's emotion, you can do that. But this kind of love, no, it's more than that. This kind of love is actually an action that you take, a choice that you make, regardless of how you feel sometimes. I heard a guy one time say, love that is emotion, love is partly emotion, but love that is emotion only is shallow and it's destined to fail. True love, God's love, listen to me. God wants to help you to learn to act in love even if you don't feel love at the moment. And that's a supernatural thing, but it's a choice you can make. It leads me to say this about love. Okay, here's kind of the way I I would, I would summarize this. Love is a choice you make. It's a habit that you shape if you make these choices over and over, and it's a lifestyle that you cultivate. I'm convinced that living in love is something that as you surrender to God daily and make loving choices, God can begin to help you live a life of love. Now, Paul gave 10 different descriptors, 10 choices that love uh, that you can make for love until it becomes your lifestyle. Now, two of them are positive, and eight of these descriptors were negative. I don't know if you saw that. Love is not this. Love is not that. Kind of reminds me of that country song right now. I may not know what love is, but I sure know what love ain't. Right? Well, Paul's saying, this is, love it. This is, this is not it. Right? But I've turned them into positive statements. I'm going to give you 10 of them real quick. This is, these are the choices that you can begin to make every day to be a better lover. To be the person that Christ is calling you to be right where you are. And listen, if you'll learn to give love, I'm convinced that God will let love come back. All right, the first one is this. I choose to be patient. I choose to be patient. Love is patient. Patient means macro thumos. It takes you a long time to blow your top. The idea from the, from the Hebrew world was that you had a long nose because whenever you got mad, it came out of your nostrils. I had a buddy named uh, Robert Patterson. We called him Pooty. He was a big dude. Whenever he got mad, his nose would flare out. And we'd go, step back, right? So he had, had this long nose. The idea is it takes you a long time. If your nostrils are flaring out, you might could bring it back in. Have a long nose. Be patient. Don't blow your cool. That's it. The idea is that you don't blow it. 
The Thayer's Dictionary defines this word as you be patient in bearing the offenses and injuries of others, to be mild and slow in avenging, to be long-suffering, slow to anger, slow to to punish. Here's the way I would say it. If you're patient, you're slow to just go off on somebody. You know what I'm talking about? You're slow to just go off. I was talking to a friend recently who was observing his grandfather in a particularly tense situation in business, and he knew that his grandfather typically would would lose his cool. But in the recent years, man, his grandfather's just gone through a transformation. And he watched him handle it with grace, and he said, Abuelo, how, how did you do that? How did you handle that so patiently? And his grandfather told him, he said, listen, whenever I'm feeling the tension, I go into my office, I say, God, you gotta help me. Help me to be kind and patient. And then I give it to God, and then I'm better. Love is patient. It's a learned gift of God's spirit if you'll let him. Here's the second choice you can make. I choose to be kind. Love is kind. You do things that are beneficial for the other person. Regardless of how they treat you, you choose to do what is good for them and not harsh. It's the opposite of being mean. Come on, mean is easy. But kindness is a supernatural choice of love. You be kind at your home. You be kind with your roommates. Here's the third choice. I choose to bless you. Now, this is a positive way of saying the negative that Paul said. Paul said love's not jealous. Jealousy sets your heart on something that somebody else has and says, I want to take what you have. You you hate other people or hate on them for what they have. Jealousy is a green-eyed monster. And come on, it can kill you, right? Isn't that what we know? It's dangerous. Think about it in the Bible. Cain was jealous of his brother Abel and what was going on between him and God. And guess what Cain did? He killed him. Joseph had this multicolored coat that his dad gave to him, right or wrong. He wore it and kind of put it in his brother's faces, but his brothers were jealous of him, the Bible says in Acts chapter 7. They were jealous of him and sold him as a slave. Essentially, they were killing him. I've been reading through the Gospel of Mark, and I'm I'm, I'm amazed at how the religious leaders were so jealous of Jesus. As a matter of fact, when they turned him over to Pilate, this is what the Bible says in Mark 15, verse 9. Pilate answered them saying, hey, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? Hey, man, I'm ready to let Jesus go. For he was aware that the chief priest had handed him over because of envy. Not some doctrinal dispute. Envy. And they killed Jesus. The Bible says that jealousy will wreck you. Come on. A jealous love? That ain't love. Jealousy is going to ruin your relationship. James 4, 2 says this. You lust and you do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious. That's our word. You're envious and you cannot obtain, so you fight. And you quarrel. And you don't have because you don't ask. I mean, you got to ask God to give you grace. See, the opposite of jealousy and wanting to put somebody down or take what they have is to celebrate them, to celebrate God's blessing and good fortune in their life. You actually thank God and wish the best on them. When your friends all go on a beach trip and they don't ask you, you jealous or do you celebrate that? Oh, I pray for them. I pray it rains the whole time they're down there, right? I mean, isn't that what we do? We get jealous. But what God wants to teach you to do is to say, man, bless y'all. I hope y'all have a great time. That may be like, seem like a forever galaxy away, but it can happen. That's true love. Here's another choice that love makes. Love chooses. I choose to talk about you. I'm not talking about you behind your back. I choose to talk about you when we're together. Paul says it this way. Love does not brag. You don't make yourself the center of attention and talk about all you have done and all that you've got. The word brag literally means to praise yourself excessively. You ever heard somebody say, uh, don't toot your own horn? Y'all, y'all heard that? Toot your own horn, right? Today, kids say, man, gas each other up. Man, we're going to gas each other up. Man, it ain't nothing wrong with somebody else tooting your horn or gassing you up. But don't toot your own horn. Don't gas yourself up. Ain't nobody studying that, right? But it happens. And so what love does is love says, I don't want to talk about me. I want to talk about, as Toby Key said, you. I want to talk about you sometimes. I want to talk about me, but I want to talk about you. I was with a group of high profile preachers recently. Um, and it's, 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 a, it's an interesting dynamic when you get around a bunch of preacher boys. And uh, most of them are awesome. They're probably all awesome guys for sure. But there was one guy in particular, every conversation, anytime you're circled up, anytime you're around, you know, you, everybody's talking. This one guy dominated the conversation. Everything was about him. Everything was about what he did and what he's doing and blah, 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 blah. And, and look, I love this guy, admire this guy. But I just wondered, what was that? 
What was that? Is, is that pride? Is it insecurity? What is that that makes a person have to dominate conversation and let it always be about them? Can I give you a little secret? Great lovers are interested in other people. You want to be a great lover? You, want to be, you, you really want to draw people into you? People be into you? Don't talk about you. Say, tell me about you. Tell me about how your life is. What are you up to? What are you into? You choose to talk about the other person. Here's another one. I choose humility. Love's not arrogant. Arrogance is really the, often the attitude behind the bragging. It's a mindset that has an overinflated view of itself, how important I am. It means I've, I've blown myself up. We say you got the big head. You think that you and your life matters more than everybody else, but love does the opposite. Love says you matter more. So can I ask you a question? Do you intentionally or not? It's not about intention. Does this happen? Do you demand to be the center of attention? Do you demand to be the topic of every conversation, the hero of every story? That's not everybody, but for some of us, if that's your battle, that's not love. Let me tell you, there's a more excellent way. It's the way of humility to say you matter as much as I do. Let's, let's talk about you. Let's do things that make you happy. Here's another choice. This is number six. I choose to treat you right at all times. Love does not act unbecomingly. That means to act unbecomingly means you act in defiance of social and moral standards with resulting disgrace, embarrassment, and shame. You ever seen somebody do something stupid and you go, stay classy? Come on, y'all know y'all said that before. Yeah, stay classy. You're being, you're being um, sarcastic because what you just did was the exact opposite of classy. They were acting unbecomingly. Now, a lot of times, acting unbecomingly is fueled by either alcohol or insecurities. Let's just be honest. You had a little bit, and next thing you know, your inhibitions are diminished, and you're doing stuff you would never do sober. That's not smart. Or maybe it's your insecurities. You just want everybody at your school to like you. You just want to be considered funny. You just want to be considered cool or hip. And so you're doing stuff that you know is not even right. You're acting unbecomingly. And can I just say to you, that stuff that you used to do when you were in high school or college to get a laugh and be the center of attention, that was funny then. But when you're 35, that's tired. That ain't funny. And so you got to grow up. you got to grow into what God has called you to be and act in love. And love doesn't act unbecomingly. Interestingly, this word unbecomingly is also used in Romans 1.27 and Ephesians 5.4. And it's associated with sexuality and sensuality. So from the way that you dress, to the way that you talk, to the things that you do, don't act unbecomingly. Instead, you say, I'm going to treat you right all the time. I'm not going to use you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to hurt you. I choose to treat you right and to honor you no matter where we are or who's with us. Here's another choice. I choose to act selflessly. Love doesn't seek its own. Love doesn't demand its way all the time. It doesn't demand its rights. It doesn't seek its own advantage. I hate to tell you this, but, but a lot of times when I'm in a conversation and somebody asks, you know, says, hey, let's go do this, that, or the other, my initial impulse is, how's this going to impact me? Am I the only one? Does anybody out there worshiping today at Pine Lake feel like, man, that, that's just, I don't like it, but it, it, it is. How's this going to impact me? What is this going to cost me? Where is this gonna, what is this going to require? And yet love has to learn to act selflessly. Jesus modeled selflessness. I'm reading about his life repeatedly right now in this season of my, my Bible reading plan. And I'm reading that he left heaven and he came to earth primarily to honor God the Father, but also to serve you by giving his life. And I'm reading that whether Jesus was washing feet or delaying his vacation because everybody was so hungry and needed more food and wouldn't leave him alone, or whether he was walking the way of the cross, he was laying down his life many times against what he felt naturally to put others first. That's what love does. And love chooses to be peaceful. That's the, the eighth thing Paul says. It chooses to be peaceful. Love is not provoked. To be provoked means you're irritated and angry. Now, then, listen, that's not to say that on occasion you're, you're not going to feel anger and even act to say, hey, listen, this is not right. Jesus did that, didn't he? 
He turned over to temple tables one day, but that was not about him. That was about God and about these people who were being robbed. Most of the times when we get mad, when we get angry, when we get provoked, it's because I feel like you did me wrong. And Paul's saying that's not what love does. Disagreements and unmet expectations are common in every relationship. Can I say that again? Disagreements and unmet expectations, it's common. Whether you're talking about friends, coworkers, or marriage, it doesn't matter. We're going to disappoint each other and let each other down because we're imperfect. And there are going to be times whenever you feel slighted, mistreated, or even done smooth wrong. You stole from me. But by God's grace, we try not to let that land on our hearts and then lash out in anger and frustration. No, you choose peace. I think you can and should have hard conversations from time to time. That's not natural for some of us. I think you should. You're not called to be a peacekeeper. You're called to be a peacemaker. But good peacemakers and lovers don't let irritations set them off and get the best of them. They choose the right time and the right way to say, hey, can we talk? I choose peace. Number nine, I choose to forgive. Love doesn't take into account a wrong suffered. It's a picture of an accountant keeping books and marking everyone. It's a picture of a person who's keeping score. Come on, you can itemize, uh, give an itemized record of every wrong that's ever done. I mean, we all heard about that guy who was at the counselor with his wife, and he says, man, listen, dude, every time me and my wife fight, she gets historical. And the counselor says, I think you mean hysterical. He said, no, historical, man. She brings up everything I've ever done. Y'all know somebody like that? Don't point at them right now. You might get slapped. But you know what I'm saying? There there are things, and it's natural. It lands on us, and it it hurts us. It wounds us. It's like we hold on to it. But that's not love. That's what Paul's saying. The love of God doesn't hold on to that record of wrongs. If you've got a list in your mind of all the ways and times that you've been done wrong, you're probably not going to act in love. So surrender that to God and say, God, would you just help me to lay that down? Here's the last thing. I choose to be faithful and true. Love doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness. Please listen. Love doesn't cheat. It doesn't steal. It doesn't lie. And it doesn't live in the shadows. That's not love. It doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness. It rejoices with the truth. It rejoices when there's faithfulness and honesty and just being real. That's what true love celebrates. You have to work for it. That's what I'm learning. You have to work for it. But you can celebrate whenever you're making these games and learning to live naked and unashamed, connecting at the deepest level. That's what love does. Love says, I'm safe, and you're safe with me. And so we're choosing to be faithful and true. I remember a story about... Uh, Pastor E.V. Hill, uh, African-American pastor in Los Angeles back in the, the mid-1900s. Uh, and and uh, he, he pastored in Los Angeles during the Watts riots. And, and, and Pastor Hill, I love him, man. He was an unbelievable pe- preacher and orator. And look, he just, he shucked the corn. Y'all know what I'm saying? He shucked the corn. He didn't care where you were, who you were. He just opened up God's word and said, this is the way it goes. Which mean, meant that a lot of people on both sides of the issues were mad at him. And some of the anarchists were threatening to bomb him, to blow him up. And one morning he woke up and his wife was not in bed and she was normally there and he was concerned. He called for her throughout the house and she wasn't there. He went outside and his car was gone. And he was really, really concerned. In a few minutes, she came driving up, pulled up in the driveway and he said, woman, where have you been? And she said, well, I just got to thinking that this community needs you more than it needs me. And I was thinking that if they were going to rig your car to be bombed, I wanted to be in it and not you. She said, there ain't no bomb in it, baby. You can drive it to work today. Hill said, from that day forward, I never had to wonder what love looked like and whether or not my wife loved me. Come on. Love, love that is emotion only is shallow and it's destined to fail. But you can have a love that's a choice that you make, a habit that you shape, and a lifestyle you cultivate of putting others ahead of you. Last thing, love lasts. Okay, So love matters most. 
Love's a choice primarily, not an emotion. Paul winds up this little section in Scripture in, in 1 Corinthians 13, and he says, love lasts. Verse 7 says, love bears all things, believes all things, it hopes all things, it endures all things. Love never fails, it never quits, it never runs out, it never gives up. He goes on in verses 9 through 12 to say there's a lot of stuff that are going to go away. Prophecies are going to cease, miracles and speaking in tongues and supernatural revelations. That's all going to pass away. We learned last week political kingdoms and nations will rise and fall. If you've ever read the Bible, you know even this present earth and present heaven all going to be burned up. But the one thing that remains is love. The last verse, 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says, but now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, <clears throat> come on, Valentine's Day, but the greatest is love. Love lasts because God lasts. God, God is love, and God lasts. And he wants you to have a love that lasts as well, a love for him that never quits. But please hear me, a love from him that so fills you that it never runs out either. Paul says whenever you have this kind of love, this kind of love that lasts, and listen, I'm speaking to somebody right now, you're, you're on the brink, and you don't know if you can do it anymore. Would you listen again to what Paul says about the characteristics of his love? that he wants you to experience and then give away. Lasting love, he said, bears all things. It means it covers literally people's wrongs. It doesn't, please don't, don't hear this. It doesn't sweep it under the rug. All that's going to do is be a, a mountain eventually in your living room and everybody in the family is going to trip over it. No, to cover sin and bad behavior isn't to excuse it. It means I'm giving it grace. 1 Peter 4, 8 says, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Love's not sweeping it under the rug. Love is saying, you hurt me. Those choices have wounded me, but I'm choosing to give you grace. Nobody's perfect. We're all in process. We all do many, many dumb things that are selfish and unloving, but you can say, I have grace for that. In a lasting love believes all. That doesn't mean that you are gullible and you just believe anything people tell you. I had a friend one time who he used to tell his wife, hey, I'm going to run to the store. And six hours later, he would come back home. He was battling an addiction. And he, she would say, where have you been? And he would say, well, you know, I went to the store and then I wanted to go get a movie. So I was at Blockbuster. That was a long time ago. I went to Blockbuster. I just couldn't find anything. Then I met him, ran into so-and-so. And man, we sat there and talked. And she would go, okay. No. No, uh-uh, that ain't it. That ain't it. To believe all things doesn't mean that you're gullible and that you just excuse anything that somebody is doing. True love is discerning and wise. To believe all doesn't mean you believe everything that you hear. I think to believe all means this, that no matter what it's like right now in this present circumstance, at home, at work, at school, wherever it is, to, to believe all things is to say, God, no matter how hard or harsh it is, you can still turn it around. I don't have to fix it. I'm going to trust you. And I think it does mean that I believe all things, that I believe the best in you. Every love relationship is built on trust. And unless somebody has proven themselves untrustworthy, it means that we choose to trust and believe that in the gap between what I know and what I don't know, I don't fill that with questions and, and skepticism and doubt and the worst things that could come to mind. No, I fill that gap with trust. That's a choice that love makes. I believe in you and I believe in us. And lasting love hopes in all circumstances. A hope that waits patiently for the right outcome. It's the opposite of pessimism. It's actually a healthy optimism. You say, God, it is really, really bad right now. Because it is. Don't, don't act like it's not. God, this is really awful right now. God, our nation is so jacked up right now. Because it is. But God, there is no heart. There is no home. There is no nation that you don't control. And so I choose to have hope and belief that you can turn it around. Love endures, Paul said, in every season. And there's sometimes when you're in a season of pain, and that may be where you are right now, it's a season of pain and suffering and deprivation, of anger or loss or loneliness. But can I testify to you 
that Jesus Christ can supply you with the love that enables you to remain and to persevere no matter what. You got to fight for it. But he can do it. It endures every season. It never fails. It never stops. Even when everything else in God's creation is gone, love still remains. Now, I feel like I need to clarify for some. Does that mean that you have to tolerate an unloving, unhealthy, unchristian behavior from some person that you're in relationship with? And the answer to that is yes and no. On the one hand, yes. That's what love does. And I'm so thankful that my wife continued to love me, especially in our early years of marriage, when I was so immature and so stupid, a lot stupider than I am today. I was so self-centered and so caught up that I didn't act in love many, many times. And I'm so thankful that she didn't throw in the towel and say, forget this. And I'm so thankful that by God's grace, through perseverance and prayer, she stayed, we stayed, we made it through. So sometimes, yes, you, you have to endure. But sometimes, no. Honestly, sometimes I don't think the loving thing to do is necessarily to stay in a relationship that is unhealthy and permissive of unacceptable behavior. I don't think you have to stay in a relationship that's abusive. I think you may actually need to cut off that addict in your family out of love. I think it's very, very possible that you may need to create some space between you and a person who repeatedly and habitually acts in dishonoring and destructive ways toward the relationship. You don't have to stay in that way. I'm thinking about the prodigal son, quite honestly. The father loves his son like crazy, but he let him go. And he let him go off to the far country and he didn't chase after him. But when the prodigal returned, the father loved him unconditionally. He doesn't condone the son's behavior. He didn't let him come home and still act a fool. For a season, this father, in love, let his son go to a very, very bad place. And the father didn't know what was happening to his son. And maybe it felt unloving at the time. But love never left his heart. And so lovingly, he waited for his son to come to his senses and then come home so that they could have relationship again. And when his son did, the father covered him in love because that's what love does. You know what I'm thankful for? I'm thankful that God loves you and me that way. His love for you is great. And he has demonstrated his love for you by giving his son, Jesus, to die for you. And his love never runs out. It's undeserved, but it's also unconditional, and it's unending. And so here's what I want to help us to do today. We're going we're to close these next couple of minutes by taking communion. I think there's probably going to be a song sung over us while we're, while we're getting our communion elements, if you need to go do that here in a minute, if you haven't already, or as you're waiting, contemplating, before I come and lead us to, to eat and drink together. But here's what I want you to be thinking about in these next few minutes. That God loves you. He loves me. And it's an unconditional love. And it's undeserved, but yet it's real and it's true. He's acted in love toward you and that love lasts. And then I want you to say, God, the love that you are giving to me even right now and maybe confessing that sin to God or those things that have separated you from God, confessing those things, saying, God, I receive your love again. And now, God, would you help me to give love where I live? If you've never accepted Jesus, now would be a great time for you to do that. To just say, Jesus, come into my life, change me. Listen, we want to help you. You can, you can always text the word Jesus or the word pray, either one, to 57555. We're going to help you. But in these next couple of minutes, would you just have a time with the Lord where you receive love, get cleansed in that love by his grace, and then say, God, I want to learn to give it away. After I pray, man, we'll get our communion elements, and, and then I'll lead us in just a few minutes to eat and drink together. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your great love. We rest in it now. Teach us to love like you do. Help us to do what we don't think we can do on our own. But by your grace, God, you're going to make a way. 
We need it in Jesus' name. Amen.